I just remember it was like, I'm not leaving this room until I kiss this guy. We just had a relationship, you know, and I just, I knew him. I knew that at least I could kiss him. And even if it didn't work out, he wouldn't tell anybody. So yeah, it was super wonderful. And as soon as I did that, I was like, oh, now I understand why my parents didn't want me to do this kind of stuff. And uh, so we go our separate ways. I go back home and it's like, I don't know, one in the morning or something. And we, we end up calling each other as we do every night. We both said like, that was great. And I was like, yeah, thanks for the kiss. It was amazing, by the way. However, literally, I'm going to reiterate this. We cannot do this again. 15 minutes later, he calls me back and he, his voice was so different. It, he was just like, Lindsay. Um, and I was like, what's going on? What's wrong? And I was like, wide awake, sat up in my bed. He was like, so um, this individual uh, came to my door just now and said that he heard our conversation and um, we have 24 hours to tell Bill or he will. Wow. You know who you are out there in the universe. You know who you are. First of all, first of all, what were you doing up at one in the morning? Uh huh. Because I guarantee you, you weren't calling your mom and dad to pray with them or something. So what were you doing? Anyway, he also married someone from headquarters, so we know what he was doing. Oh, um, really? <clears throat> How yes. interesting. Yes. The hypocrisy is so real. It's so, it's, I, can't. I, I would like to throw a different spin on it, though, but like, wasn't that your out? Well, yes, but no, it was, it was, I had to, my out was, that was my beginning of the out, but I had to go through five months of hell first. No Ooh, offense, yeah. but I had to go through the hellfires yeah. first. But um, yeah, so I was like, well, uh, we got, we got to do this. And I did not tell him this, but I'm like, <laughs> I'm screwed because mm -hmm. now I'm going home. Like yeah. I have to go back to the place I just hoped I would never would again. Um, mm -hmm. So two days later, he was sent home with, and his brother went with him. <clears throat> as a loyal brother would, um, you know, I'm not going to stay here, you know, stand for my brother. So they go home together and I remain there. I remain there for like three more months and not really much is said. And a letter was, was read, um, from my husband to the group of his, like, you know, the big apology that you have to do where like, Oh, I have sinned and therefore I must expose myself and how I defrauded a young lady and blah, 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 blah. Um, I personally do not remember myself having to do it. I remember him doing it, like writing the letter and it was written or read. And then that was it. Um, so I have felt the fires of everybody around me, you know, because they knew it was me. And uh, yeah, so three more months. And then uh, Bill sat me down one day after the morning meeting and he was like, so Lindsay, uh, I can't not talk like him. Whenever I soon him, like, well, Lindsay. <laughs> it's just how he talks. Um, how are your feet today? How are, are they clean? You? <laughs> <laughs> Did you, babe? <laughs> oh, stop Still a that. virgin? What that are was, you talking about? What if that was his primary concern? It wasn't even the kiss. He was like, "Did he touch your feet? Did, Did he, he touch, he touch feet, your though? feet? <laughs> Did your feet touch his feet? I have to know." Because I will have him send the socks down and we will burn them in the front oh, yard. It's so good. <laughs> oh my God, I can't. His eyes are so red. He's just like, tainted feet, you must leave. <laughs> your feet have been defiled. Oh my God. <laughs> can you put your shoes on? This is the first time I've ever had to say that, but can you put your shoes on? Oh. I would like to invite you to put your shoes back on, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> They're unclean. They're so impure. Those are the harlot toes of yours. <laughs> Get those Jezebel feet out of here. Oh, my God. My oh, sides are. That's so hurt. funny. That's amazing. <laughs> Which just completely went off the rails with the feet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was quite wonderful, though. I love being uh, able to just, like, have that full gut bust laugh over just <laughs> how absurd everything was. <laughs> So Insane. thank you for that. Whoa. Um, but he basically just sat me down and he was like, I have tried with the board to keep you here for as long as I possibly can. Um, but they do not want you here any longer. So it wasn't Bill. It was the board. The board mm -hmm. no longer wanted me. And to be quite honest with you, I didn't know who the board was. Who did the board consist of specifically? But I was like, wow, the board knows who Lindsay Harris is. You know, this is not good. Um, so I felt really ashamed because I kind of thought that like the, you know, the dust had settled and, you know, I'd kind of like got stayed under the radar. Um, but he was like, so we're going to have you um, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you go to Oklahoma Training Center and uh, you'll be able to work there for a while. And um, and I, was, I interjected. I'm like, well, let me let me just uh, talk to my parents. You know, like I know there's a lot going on at home. And honestly, I was like, I didn't even know much about Oklahoma Training Center, but just the training center was at the end. The answer mm-hmm. was no, thank you, please never uninvite myself. Let's go home. And uh, he was just like, well, I've already spoken with your father and he is he has given me given us the blessing to send you to Oklahoma. And I was like, well, clearly I don't have a dog in this fight anymore because, you know, the authorities have made their decisions for me. I am 21 years old and people are still totally dictating my life. So, yeah, a week later, packed everything up and left headquarters and uh, went down to the Oklahoma City Training Center where I met Barry Rice again. (laughs) (laughs) And this time, so I've heard, he wanted nothing to do with me. (laughs) Oh, God, no. Of, like, the plague. But I was already avoiding all girls as as much as possible. (laughs) But, I mean, look, Davey knows me. Davey, do I like to avoid girls? No, (laughs) you certainly do not. That is not your passion. So it, it was a hard, it was a hard fight for me, but yeah, yeah, I, but I want, so I want to know two things. I want to know, number one, uh, between the kiss and getting kicked out, did the prayer sessions continue? Okay. I will say, I don't recall. I actually don't. Oh, um, I, I'm going to guess that, uh, maybe a couple times or maybe just before I left, but I was so checked out. Um, probably the last year that I was at headquarters, I was so disillusioned and so angry and so just pissed at everything. Like my anger was finally rising up a little bit, but only inside. I wasn't acting on it. But I have two testimony tapes. And at some point I'm going to share them on TikTok. But one of them is when I first got there and I sound like I am 14 years old and I've got a little bit of a Southern accent and aren't I just cute. And then uh, the two and a half years later, oh, I am bitter as fuck. Like, I Mm. sound like a bitter, rebellious girl. What what do you mean testimony? So when you were, when you're there at headquarters, um, if you last six months, they, like, if you stay there for six months, like, you know, some people would come in for like three months and then they go home or, you know, maybe they would go to a training center or they go overseas or whatever. So it was, it was always a revolving door at headquarters. But if you were there for six months and then you kind of get on staff and you're, you're working, you know, you'll, you could stay there for 10 years. I mean, you could get completely forgotten about really, if you weren't a Gothard girl. Um, so you could sustain yourself. And what they would do is if you stayed that long, they would ask you to give a testimony. So, you know, the very basic one when you first get there, it's like, how did you get into ATI and ABLP? It's like, you know, the whole thing, like, what is your birth order, your spiritual gift, and da 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 and how did you become a Christian, and what do you think your life calling is, and what's your life verse, and where are you working here at headquarters, and what called you here, and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I think it's like a 20-minute 20, 20 uh, testimony, 25 minutes maybe, that I gave, and I sound like a child. I am so naive. I am so innocent. The world is the oyster, you know, at that point. And then you, and then you hear, I was there long enough that they came back around two and a half years later. And oh, am I a crusty old lady who just hates <laughs> life? I mean, it had just been footsied right out of me. Like all of my passion in the world and everything is bright and shiny. It was just so dull and crusty. Um, I've played it for Chad from Shiny Happy People, and he just has cackled at how funny it is, how different I was at that point. Hmm. My voice dropped uh, to like in the how I talk now, like where I was just more like normal me. And I didn't have that high, really soft voice where I just sound like I'm so innocent and naive. And, you know, I, I couldn't hurt a fly. Um, I like to add a little southern twit. Yeah, I like toes. <laughs> My toes are really long. I can pick things up with them. <laughs> oh, come on. I've been come practicing on. the no, piano no, with no my more. toes. No more. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can play it will be worth it all with my toes. I can. And when I sing the high note, I put the middle one up real high. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah. My, so. my second question is, what did you do at Oklahoma City? I don't remember. <laughs> so many things Bryce so you many got things passed around department to department well when i first got there i had the scarlet letter on me i mean mm-hmm. everybody knew i was from headquarters but no one knew why i was from headquarters like what i the had hell? no idea yeah 
I don't think anybody knew. Even I don't think Erin even knew for several months. She didn't know why I was there either. Um, and I started with just, uh, you know, cleaning already cleaned hotel rooms, hmm. um, which I thought was the most bizarre. Again, these monotonous exercises to actually make you insane. Um, I just I would rip clean sheets off and take them downstairs and wash them and then put them back on the bed and I would wash already clean windows. I mean, there were times where I would literally spit at the window just so I would have something to clean because it was so irritated. I'm like, I am 21 years old and I am doing this monotonous, stupid crap. Like, why? No one's listening. No one's hearing me. No one cares. I felt so invisible. Like, people did not want to talk to me. So mm. not only that, I'm just, not only am I here and I don't want to be, I'm fully isolated. And then I have the Farrenbrooks up my butt who are literally oh. like, I'm telling you, Mrs. Farrenbrook, she is uh, Cruella DeVille and constantly up my butt about memorizing scripture and, and, and constant, like every day it was, okay, how far have you gotten now? And if I messed up one, go back to your room and do it again. And I, and, and then, you know, here I am cleaning all these bathrooms and men hotel rooms and trying to memorize all of this scripture. And it was just, it was such a bizarre duress that was so unnecessary. Hmm. I kissed a boy. This is not normal. Can anybody please look at this and say, this is not normal. Um, I, I did not know at the time, but I am gluten intolerant. Bill Gothard loves whole wheat rolls. Oh my God, does he love those whole wheat rolls? Well, did you have the uh, <laughs> the whole wheat biscuits and gravy at the Oklahoma City Training Center where you had to like you had to hold the plate with both hands when they put it on there, or you would, or the plate would break, or you would drop it? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> One biscuit, you're like, huh? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, it like it just at at any point in time, I like I just even at headquarters, I would avoid. The, like going to lunch uh the, like the last year i was there because i didn't know why my stomach would hurt all the time after i would eat these meals i didn't i wasn't getting sent to a doctor oh i just have a stomach ache i have a stomach ache i don't know i'm a girl i guess i'm weak i guess i have a fragile ecosystem i don't know i'm, I'm a weak one help me um so uh, here i am at oklahoma and my stomach was just starting to hurt so bad and i also now that i know i have cptsd i have all this repressed stuff so the anxiety was coming out um, it like, it was just percolating in my gut. And so there were times where I would just be, I would go up to her and I was just like, I just, sorry, I just really do not, I, I can't even stand up straight. I, my stomach is hurting so bad. And she's like, well, you should go to your room and pray to the Lord because clearly you haven't purged from you, everything from the sin that you had at headquarters. Are you and serious? I was, yeah, no, dead serious. And so I would go up to my room and I would just sob on the bed and I'm like, no one is helping I don't, what can I do? Like, I can memorize as much scripture as possible. I can curl my hair as big as possible. I can wear the most modest clothing. And it's not going to matter what you, th it's not going to change how you see me and what you think of me. Right. Um, I ended up, so I think, I think it was maybe like two months, or maybe a month that I was there when I was doing all this cleaning. And then they put me into, is it, the character first with Corey down in the front part of the building. There was like a strip of offices down by the piano and stuff. Oh, that was Was it character first? It was it was I think it was character first education. May was yeah. Down there. Okay. So I was helping with like office stuff in there. Um I was helping with office stuff for a little while there. And then I don't know what made the change happen, but I started going into the public schools with character first. Um, so I was like going out every every day into the public schools. Uh, Wesley Danson, I think was his name. Wesley, yeah, Wesley. Uh, Wesley, Wesley Danson and is, I. Tell me, he's he you had good experience because I he absolutely was, I did. He yes. he was literally like he was the sunshine to my full hell existence, and he was mm. one of the only guys that I was actually allowed to even have any type of conversation with or like even smile at you know because we had to teach in front of the same classroom you know it was always a guy and a girl and i was like wow this is at first i was like this is a trap they're trying to get me <laughs> they're they're gonna find something that i'm doing and then they're gonna put me into a deeper pit of hell somewhere they probably have a like i don't know a, a room that they're gonna lock me in and i'm never gonna get out um i had not really heard of the indie 
rooms as much as I know the now. Rooms. Yeah, but I was like, there's got to be something. Something is going to happen here and I'm going to trip up and I'm going to totally mess up and it's going to be even worse. Um, or Bill's going to find out and somehow my name's going to be in the next newsletter or something. <laughs> I had so yeah. much fear. But Wesley was such such a, a wonderful, wonderful soul. And I was it Joel, the really, really tall guy? Yep. Um, I just remember blonde. I think he also went to Romania with us. If I, if my memory serves I me think correct. So. Um, yeah. Before so like, first. Yeah. But he so was one of the original. Staffs. Maybe, maybe that's how it happened because he remembered me from Romania too, because I had gone to Romania in the very beginning of being at, uh, headquarters. But, um, so I was, I knew Joel, obviously now I knew Corey and then I had Wesley and it was just, I finally felt like I could breathe a little bit more. Um, like they weren't judging me. They didn't seem to know what had happened. Um, and I liked being able to be with the kids because at least I knew what I was talking about with the children's Institute and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I felt like I was in my wheelhouse, but it was during that time that I actually ended up having my first IBS attack in, I was at, in the public school, we were teaching and I just looked at Wesley and I was like, I'm not okay. I need to leave the room. And I ran to the bathroom. My, I could not believe how bad my stomach was hurting. I literally thought I was going to actually die in this public school um, and took Whoa. me forever to like get out of the bathroom. I was so scared. I didn't know what was happening to me. And of course, I get back to the training center and I tell Mrs. Farenbrook what happened. And again, she's like, you know, the Lord is really coming down on you and trying to like purge you of your mm. sin and your immodest ways and da, 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 da. And I was like, this woman is such a tyrant. And um, I think at that point, I finally broke down and I told your sister. I was just like, this is what happened at headquarters. And I just don't understand why I'm being treated this way. And I feel so awful all the time, physically, mentally. And she's like, wait a minute, you kissed a guy? And I was like, yes. And she's like, that is not what we've been hearing. And I was like, what What do you mean? <laughs> what have you been hearing? And she's like, we've been hearing that you slept with someone at headquarters. What? And I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, huh? Those are two very, very different things. And I don't even know how to go on the record to say, excuse me, everybody, in morning meeting, where they also started making me play the freaking piano. And I was like, this really is, I, I am that. in hell. I don't want to play the piano in front of everybody when they're looking at me and treating me like I'm so ostracized. And this is another, it was just, it felt like another punishment. Um, and now I'm aware that everyone thinks this like really horrific thing about me. And I, I have no voice. I can't. I can't Which still wouldn't even be that horrific. You, you know, you're <laughs> yeah. 21 at 21. this point. Yeah, I'm an adult. My sister, though, like. She was so lovely. I mean, and I think great. she. Yeah. And I think she actually was like, I'm going to try to tell a few people like what really happened. And I was like, please, please tell everybody. <laughs> yeah. Please tell everybody. You didn't tell me. <laughs> yeah, I never heard that oh, about darn you. It. Okay. Nobody okay. ever told me anything. But I mean, this was towards the end of our our time there and we were mm-hmm. we were both pretty checked out i was just like oh, what am i doing you know but i was very loyal to my director mm-hmm. um my yeah. director do you remember him david mm-hmm. frederick yeah yeah david frederick was one of the directors of character first business he did okay. work at headquarters at some time at one point uh but he was my director and i was mm-hmm. very loyal to him because he was normal yeah yeah <laughs> you know and um when he he went to australia and i was like ah, i'm gonna go to australia with him nice I'm gonna work with david frederick in australia we he took care of me in australia we had Good. a few he's like hey, i'm gonna get you out and he no. ran a motorcycle and amazing run on the back of the motorcycle through <laughs> australia you know there were some other things i, I don't i'll it was a Nothing like awful, but like of, at the time, like what he took you where? It's like it's uh, rebellious. It was... Yeah, I mean, you're not right. you're not following the line of what you're supposed to and the behaviors that you're supposed. He, that he you're took me downtown to Melbourne at night, and we mm. like just we would just talk and walk around. Yeah, and we may or may not have walked through a casino during that time. <laughs> oh, wow. May or may not have oh, happened. A den of iniquity. Whoa! Whoa. Just walked through it. <laughs> My first like casino was when I was in my thirties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been in them. I've never gambled. <laughs> it's boring. I don't like watching my money go away like that. It's dumb, right? right? <laughs> it's not boring if you're good at it. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> um, so you were at headquarters for three years, mm-hmm. and then you were in Oklahoma for how long? Five months. Five months, mm-hmm. and then what? What was? The catalyst I for your escape finally from Oklahoma. I so hard. 
I was like, I am reformed. God has spoken to me. I've given testimonies. I know how this works. I know what to say. Cute and cuddly, boys. Cute and cuddly. So I just remember I went up to Mrs. Barenbrook at one point and I was like, I just really feel the Lord leading me to give my testimony. Um, and I was like, I just knew that this was going to be the way. It's going to be the way. And uh, so I did. I gave my testimony about like what happened at headquarters. So, you know, like I sinned morally and I allowed one of my fellow members of uh, IBLP to fall and da 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 da. And, you know, the Lord has really impressed upon me to, to really change my heart. You know, you, use, you can use all the words. We all know them. Where, mm-hmm. And when did that happen? It, it was I don't like, remember that. well, I don't know. Maybe you were watching a movie somewhere and then, you know, it's possible. I don't yeah, freaking know. The Matrix. Yeah. yeah, he was watching The Matrix for the 82nd time. How do I know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I gave this thing and, um, I was begging my dad, um, every now and then, like, please, I need to come home. They weren't living in the same, my, my parents had split. They were in different homes now. And I was like, you need someone to come home and take care of the boys. And like, mom and dad both had jobs now. And I was like, you know, I just, I felt like my whole life at home was actually disintegrating and I'd not even been there. You know, it was a whole different landscape when I showed back up. Um, and so I was just, I just kept pushing and pushing, like, please, dad, like, I need to come home. And then I gave this testimony and da da da. And I feel like the Lord is leading me that I need to be a witness and, a, and an example to my brothers as they're growing up in the world. And I, I mean, I just, I gave everything I could. Um, and within a few weeks, I ended up going back home. And mm. I will never forget getting on that airplane. And I was like, sweet God, I am never coming back here. I am wow. never stepping into another training center as long as I live. Um, and it was within a month that my my guy from headquarters that I kissed started reaching out to my dad asking for permission to court me. Um, really? Yeah. Um, as soon as I got home, uh, my friends from headquarters were like, you need to message him because he is miserable. Like he is because he he continued to work for head for headquarters at home. So he just worked remotely. And so they were all keeping up with him and stuff. And I didn't have communication with almost anybody from headquarters. So it was like I emerged five months did, later did out you of have prison. Communication with him? No. While, while you were at a, so no. five months, zero no. communication. I was like, wow. I really hope that kiss carried because it has now been eight months. What state eight was months. he in? He was in New York, upstate New York. Absolutely no goats left in New York for eight months. Just every goat was purchased. He just sucked them all up. <laughs> he was like, sir, I'm bringing them all down. Every goat in New York. And I'm going to collect a, a more on the way as I come down to Florida. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he started writing my dad because this is back in you know the days of writing letters. <laughs> and um, my dad was a very narcissistic, controlling person. And he told him no. And uh, then my dad took me out to have a coffee and read me the letter that my man wrote to him. And he's like, well, what do you think about this? And I was like, I mean, it's kind of amazing, <laughs> you know, because I was like, oh, my God, he hasn't forgotten me. And, and, and at this point, he and I had had text messages back and forth like we had we were AIM, okay. AOL. Um, so we had reconnected and it felt like we had never left each other, like the way that we wow. talked on the phone and stuff. We hadn't talked on the phone at this point, I don't think, um, but it all been through messaging. And it was the same. It was the same banter and the same fun, but also serious. And he remembered so much that I had told him about my family. And I knew I was a troubled potential wife like i don't i don't tick all the great boxes of being a, a, a good shiny happy wife person um you know again i don't have my birth father and I, I multiple times i've been said that it has been said to my face that i am a bastard um and so i was like wow. well this could be this could be a problem you know for his mom or his dad or whatever um i got in trouble for kissing him so maybe i'm seen as a harlot and, and why would they want him to be with this person and um so i had a lot of uh, my self-worth was pretty small at this point i'm like i mm. no one's gonna want me i'm completely tainted goods at this point and how sad like this is not this is not in truth at all. I know this about myself now, but back then I was just like, I don't, I don't even know if I am worthy of anybody, you know, at this point, I've just been so used and abused, I guess. Um, but my dad, he was like, so what do you think I said to him? And I was like, well, I mean, if I'm sitting here at Starbucks right now, I hope you said yes. And he's like, well, I told him no. And I, <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, sweet Jesus, please help me right now because the Fury is just, it, I, it's so palpable. And I, I will never forget pushing on the cement floor, skirting my iron chair, like as hard and angry as I could, making so much noise to embarrass him. 
um because he is easily embarrassed and uh then i shoved it into the table and i stormed out to the minivan because <laughs> we're ati of stormed course, out yeah. to the minivan and i just stood there because i can't use my arms i'm a submissive woman um so i had to wait for him to open the door for me so i could get in the car and that just seized me as well i'm like i am capable of opening my own goddamn door um and then we drove home in silence and i got home and i just i turned on my shower and i sat in the shower for almost three hours as hot as could possibly be because i did not know how to numb out the rage i felt Mm. And I just, uh, I was saying this to someone the other day where I never had the the intention or thought process of unaliving. I'm too much of a chicken and I am like, I don't like pain and discomfort. <laughs> so I didn't have that thought process at that point. But I do wonder if I would have gotten to that point had I continued to endure much more. Like mm. I was at such a breaking point mentally and emotionally so uncared about, um, unseen. And I just was like, I don't know how much more of this I can take. And thankfully, because I could still message him, I was like, well, this is what my dad told me tonight and it really sucks. And I don't know, maybe you should just go, just, just stop. Just, there's somebody else better for you because I just, I, I can't do this to you. And I definitely can't do it to myself. Like I have no more energy to fight. I just am ready to just give up um, and just be whatever the hell they need me to be. Um, and thankfully he didn't give up and his dad talked to my dad. I mean, that's a power really? move. Yeah. That's a power move Absolutely. in courtship, courtship land, you know, mm -hmm. like daddy -o of said man talking to daddy -o of said girl going, my son is freaking miserable and he is in love with your daughter. And we see that. And what do we need to do to make this right and make this okay for you? Um, so then they entered into the whole, like, let's write letters and let me get to know you. And cause somehow if he knows my husband, he's going to know that he's worthy of my heart. It's so disgusting. My dad at this point had no clue who the hell I was. No clue. I, it wasn't like I was telling him my heart the whole time on this like journey from 13 years old and getting my purity and courtship rings. Like, are you kidding? No. Um, so yeah, anyway, I'll fast track. Uh, he ended up obviously saying yes. And, um, I think three months later we ended up getting engaged and five months later we got married. Uh, it was very fast. Um, uh, my dad didn't want a long engagement, even though he lived in New York and I lived in Florida. I mean, what the hell are we doing? Because he don't want you to burn with passion. That's that's the <laughs> line I've always heard. Well, he's got to get rid of this tainted daughter somehow. Right. The guy he's has like, a lot of goats. Out. Get her out. <laughs> and he's got a lot of goats. I have no idea what this part in the letter is about. He doesn't care about feet at all. I don't understand why that's in here, <laughs> but whatever. Yeah, my parents had no idea what happened between I and Bill. Like, had I never told them. Um, I just, they weren't safe. They were not a safe space, just like everybody else mm. at headquarters. Um, and I knew if they knew, then they would blame me for it. It's always the girl's fault, you know? Right. And so I was just like, no, you're, you're not safe to tell. I did not tell them until a year and a, about a, a little over a year ago, um, when I wrote victim impact statements to my parents. What um, was their, what was their feedback on that? I haven't heard from my mother since. Um, and with my father, it took him a few months to, uh, write a response and he tried I'll give him that but without the work he will never be able to say the right things to me and I know that for a fact it's he can try but it will not be enough and it's it's been too long and even in saying at the time I'm not interested in continuing a relationship at this time it's been radio silence for over a year and I'm sorry but if you're a parent and you love love your child, that time would never be able to pass without you finding a way to make a way to restore that relationship. It's one of the reasons I am so fascinated and enamored and in love with Christine Fowler, because she found a way to humble herself for the choices that she made. And I don't say that in a condescending way with humility, because I know we all get triggered with, with uh, character quality words. But she found that way to have the compassion and to to uh, like remove herself from the situation and then look back into it and see the damage that she had caused her children. And that insight is not lost on me because I have two parents that right now want to sit in denial and defense. And I think it is one of the it is some of the most attractive dis, uh, sorry, it is some of the most unattractive behavior that I can think of in somebody. And it goes back to what we were saying earlier about the Christian church, about faith. They don't want to own it. They don't right. want to admit it. 
And so let's just sweep it under the rug somewhere, but let our kids continue to, I don't know, what, like figure ourselves out on our own. I'm sorry, but the ax forgets and the tree remembers, honey, I'm never going to forget. Mm. And I don't know that I will ever be able to actually forgive it. And I know it's not, people are constantly telling me, like, you have to forgive, Lindsay, you're never going to find peace. Oh, honey, I've got peace. Let me tell you. My forgiveness is not for free. My forgiveness is not your business. My forgiveness is not something you can demand of me. And so I, you know, it hurts, of course, but I also, I've never felt more powerful in my life than those 20 minutes reading those letters individually to both of my parents and calling them by their first name, not calling them by their title of mother and father. Um, calling them by their first names gives me distance because they've been demoted from mother and father. They don't deserve those titles anymore. It's very hard to say. I, I know that I think when I say it, it sounds like, oh, wow, she's so confident. Um, I have to stick with my confidence in that because it's so easy to gaslight yourself. I realized after a few months of waiting for them to reply that I started uh, displaying Stockholm syndrome Mm. that I needed to somehow repair something that I messed up and the guilt was there. And I was really angry at that guilt. And I was like, why, 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 why? It's the indoctrination and the conditioning that we've been put through. And I felt like I had let them down somehow. And I just needed to try harder, just like I wasn't doing in my Christian faith. I wasn't trying hard enough. I wasn't praying hard enough. I didn't use the right words. But now I know that there, it's not about me using right words. They do not have the right words. And I'm not going to allow myself to be in that mental abuse any longer because it is so unhealthy and unsafe for me to be there because I can so easily flip back into it if they were to come back to me at this point. And undo years oh God, of yeah. work mm -hmm. um, that you put into disentangle from this stuff. Yeah, People exactly. People don't understand. It, we're not looking for a Hallmark movie ending slash relationship with parents at all. It's not going to happen. We get it. We would like acknowledgement and we would like, you know, reciprocity, however you say that Reciprocity. Word right now. Thank you. Um, we would like somebody acknowledgement and, and something of that nature. You know, Davey has had conversations with his parents. I know his parents and they're, they're wonderful. And, and, hmm. and I have, I have brought up scenarios involving my mother and, and, and her grandchildren. And I was like, your mom would not do this. And he's like, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's in, you can't even conceive it that there would be anything, any sort of weird, dumb thing that would come between, you know, his mom and, and, and the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And, and that's how I feel about my niece and nephew. Like I will, I will do anything for them and anything Absolutely. for my sister. Yeah. And, um, I've had a therapist, you know, I was like, Oh, my mom's birthday's coming up and I'm, I'm not going to call her. You know, we don't, we don't really, we don't do holidays. We don't call birthdays. We don't do mother day. We don't do any of that stuff anymore. Yeah. And she's like, well, you know, are you going to be, you're going to regret this if something happens later. And I was like, you don't understand. I was homeschooled. Hmm. She had me in her life for 20 plus years. And then after that, we did everything to appease and yep. make amends and don't offend keep the peace. Yeah. All keep the peace. And I'm a peacemaker. I'm, yep. I'm the, I'm the, You're the, I'm mercy. Like the only person that can talk to my mom, my mom. Cause I am, I'm most like my mother. You're the gentle that. soul. <laughs> and so I, I told her, I was like, look, she's had me for the half of my life and it's not working out. And it's, it is a relief. To not yeah. have to sit down with my sister and be like, all right, Christmas is coming. So how are we going to handle, you know, with mom and yeah. this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. We don't have that. Now, the first year destroyed me. Yeah, yeah, Just, it does. I couldn't, I couldn't even, my brain was like, I, you're, you're choosing this over your grandchildren. Yeah. You're choosing this over your children. I don't understand it because, like I said, I will do anything for my sister or my niece. And because it's true family. love that you have for your sister. And your nieces and yeah. nephews. That is genuine love. And I don't care what any parent wants to defend themselves with, but it's not true love when they choose themselves over their children. It's, it's just not. You, you know what's such an interesting parallel, Lindsay, is how 
persistent your husband was mm-hmm. uh, in seeking you out yeah. and making it work and finding a solution. He saved me. I have said that to him a thousand times. You freaking saved me. But your parents haven't done, well, at least your mom hasn't done anything. No. Um, which is just, I, I mean, it's it's heartbreaking, obviously. It's disappointing. Uh, because as Bryce and I have talked about before, um, we, we don't want to be alienated. God, no. From no parents. one does. Yeah. That, that's not the goal here. No. Uh, the goal is reconciliation, but yeah, y- you know, it's, it's kind of like you were told, well, just forgive your parents. Well, in order for forgiveness to be given, sometimes it's got to be asked for. At least that's what we were taught in the cult. That's what right? we were taught. Yeah. You have to ask for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Well, from what I've heard, it doesn't sound like your parents have done that. There have been times where my father did. However, there is just... As a person who has been abused by a narcissist, you know when it's true and when it's not. Mm. And the crocodile tears, the falling over themselves of like, I'm so sorry, I should have disciplined you as an angry man. Um, And I don't, I I know that this is coming across a bit mocking. It's hard not to because I feel so Mm. callous sometimes about it. But I'm like, why are you crying? Why are you, why? That is not ownership, dude. That is shame, and I respect that it's shame. But you are not changing who you are. He has not changed his attitude. He has not changed the he had he like things will shift. It's like Dr. Jekyll and or Mr. Jekyll and Dr. H- whatever it is, you know what I mean? It's very two-faced. Like right. one second he's this to other people, and then he can look at me across the room and shift. It's a like freaking shift sh- shapeshifter. And I'm just like, oh, not today, sir. Not today. I think one of the first times I really, really, really stood up to him was only a couple of years ago. And I I was just like, no. Like you will not talk to me like that. And the, mm. his rage was almost equal to mine. And then he stormed off and pouted. And I was just like, oh, I cannot with this. This is a man child. But I, you know, I, I realized in that moment, he could no longer hold anything over me. He mm. can try as much as he wants to. But at 40 plus years old, I have finally found it in myself to not let this individual take any more of me or control any other part of me even even if he doesn't even think he's trying to it is so conditioned in him as well as i am conditioned to have a response to his type of behavior mm-hmm. yeah. and i'm like it is just such a hard no at this point and i'm curious brandon with with your your was it your therapist that said to you you know you're going to regret this or was that family members well it was a therapist. They asked me if I would regret okay, it. Okay, okay. Because I was like, you need no. to fire your therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of that. No person. offense, yeah. therapist. But I was like, whoo, yeah. that is not the right thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> I've struggled a lot when I see young kids playing, you know, where I realize, I'm like, wow, at this point in time, my dad would walk out at any point and drag me away and discipline me for some infraction that I didn't even know I was doing. Mm. And I, I, it just, it, it just arrests me um and and just takes my breath out of me that that again people think that it's okay to hit their children that that was the way that we were taught to train up our kids like no kid needs to be trained we're not animals you know we need to be raised and loved and nurtured and cared about and know that we have safe harbors to go to and know that there's nothing on this earth kissing a man screwing a man whatever it is any other women whatnot like whatever i chose to do if I did it with complicity and because I wanted to and I had my right to say no, I should know that my parents will always be there for me no matter what. But the fact that I held horrible things that happened away from my parents and didn't tell them <laughs> until 23 years later, hmm. you know, I mean, it just goes to show how unsafe I felt. And yeah. I I feel I'm very glad I didn't have kids because I feel like I would have had so much trauma as an, as a parent um dragged in with this and I, again when coming back to my husband i told him i was like i don't want to have kids for the first five years you have to be okay with that if you're not again i will I, as much as i love you i i will be fine not marrying you i will not do this i also didn't want to go into a relationship um feeling this like uh 
per- pervasive like uh, need to have to procreate. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, I'm I'm learning how this even works from the most horrible Christian have sex book. Um, and it, it really stunted me for a really long, long time in having a, a personal relationship with him in that way, like an intimate relationship. And he, again, such a saintly human being to have so much patience. And, you know, through therapy, we realized that the discipline and everything else that I went through also played a huge, huge role in how I took on everything when it came to intimacy. Um, and so it's it, so much confusion. And yet I didn't get help for over 20 years because even though I was not practicing IBLP and ATI when we got married, it was just, it, it had its hooks in me. I told my therapist so yeah. many, yeah, I told my therapist mm-hmm. so many times, I'm like, it's in my freaking DNA cells. It's in my cells. And I don't know how to excavate it all out. I don't think I'll ever be able to wring out every single cell to take all of this away from me. Um, and so I've learned to embrace some of the things, you know, I'm a perfectionist. I'm meticulous. I have a bit of like a fringe OCD situation going on. Um, lots of anxiety, hyper-focused. I mean, I'm really good in trauma situations, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> being calm and being at peace. Yeah. Being calm and being at peace is actually torturous to me. Um, but I'm learning to live within that skin too and just calm down and realize that that no one in my life now means harm by me. And if they do, I have the right to say, can you explain what you meant by that? Or I'm not really sure that I don't have to just asking someone a question does not actually mean that I am confronting them because that used to feel like really awful too. Like I couldn't even have a voice because then people might get mad at me, but wait, I want to say something and maybe they won't agree. And um, I'm still not the best at it. I can get really uncomfortable if I feel like someone is not on the same page with me. Um, And I have to just remind myself, like you have a right to have an opinion. No, they don't all have to agree with you. Um, So it's been a long journey, but EMDR is probably like literally the singular most thing that I attribute to really being able to change my life and my mindsets and the memories that were really, really torturing me. Yeah. And you talked about that a little bit on the live stream, actually. Yeah. Um, And and I know there were some people that reached out and it resonated for them as well. Yeah. Um, Yeah, absolutely. It was amazing. It's just, it's just so inspiring. uh, The place that you've, you've gotten to now. Lindsay, mm, and, and it's the same story that we hear. Yeah, uh, where you, you know you're in these high demand, high control groups. You grow, you go through all this trauma. Um, you finally get out, and you think that's where you're safe. Yeah, I'm free. <laughs> Which you are. Yeah, you, you are. Uh, but at the same time, that's really where the the work begins. Yeah, um, and it's a lifelong process after that. Yeah. Um, so it's just it's so cool to hear uh, about your experience. And, and I know that there's so many people out there who have been through the exact same thing, uh, that ex- have experienced the same trauma, both in, uh, the cult, whatever their cult was, uh, as well as at home. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I, I think that's another, you know, common thread with a lot of survivors like us is that while the trauma they were experiencing, the cult was bad. I mean, it was, it was that much worse at home. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so being able to, to come out on the other side of this and and share a message, uh, that carries depth, weight, and hope, uh, Mm -hmm. most importantly, um, that there is a way out, there's a solution here and, and you can find a a peaceful, happy, fulfilling life at the end of it all. Um, I just, I, I can't tell you how much, uh, I, I appreciate I can't tell you how much I appreciate hearing your story. I, I think I, I shared mm-hmm. this with you um, a while back, but um, you know, it was it was hearing your story um, that brought me to tears watching the, the Shiny Happy People documentary. Mm. You know, um, because it, I, I identify so much with it that, in spite of all that we went through, God, how how far we've come. And how great our lives truly are today. Yes. In spite of it all. Yeah. That's actually where I get emotional every freaking time. Mm -hmm. Because when I realize, I know it was 23 years (laughs) since I left the cult. But now because I have had that amount of distance, I'm able to see just how far I came and how desperately I fought 
to make something for myself and that I married someone who allowed me to have autonomy, who is a partner and not a landlord, <laughs> you know, <laughs> who is just somebody who gives a shit, who is proud of me, who supports me and allows me to do what I feel I want to do. And I in kind, you know, do the same with him. And we are just a magical couple. And I acknowledge that. I love the unicorn magic that we have. It's I realize that it is not it's it doesn't happen for everybody. And I feel really extra lucky that that we did find each other. He is the best thing that came out of headquarters. And so when I have those thoughts where like, oh, I wish I'd never gone there. I wish I'd never met Bill, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, but I met my husband. There's and your silver that lining. is absolutely <laughs> it is. And I, I get chills. And being a makeup artist and a hairstylist now is like also so bizarre for the amount of years I spent curling my damn hair to be as big as possible for Gothard. Now I'm like, oh, if only I'd known all these tricks, I, my hair would have stayed for days. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing back then. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm in rooms with, you know, naked men and women and runway shows. And, I you know, and I'm just like, yeah, if I had told my 18 year old self that this is what I was going to be doing, you know, in my 30s and 40s, she would have been like, get out of here, you Satan woman, <laughs> you woman of Satan, <laughs> you know, like, who are you? Like, <laughs> um, And I just I get to travel. And I thought that traveling. So I thought that getting into Bill's ministry, that going and, and, you know, I wanted to go to Russia, I wanted to go to Taiwan, I ended up going to Romania, but it didn't, I didn't go anywhere else after that with with the ministry. And I realized now it wasn't anything to do with being a missionary. It, I wanted to travel, I wanted to see the world, I wanted to explore, I wanted to open up and expand my horizons. And now I travel all over the world doing what I absolutely love doing, and I'm pretty freaking good at, at doing, you know, and that is That's just incredible. What the hell? Who? how many people get to say that and it's one of the reasons with shiny happy people that i i i I got involved with it because i thought if this even helps one little girl Mm -hmm. to realize that they are not alone Mm -hmm. to realize that yes it is terrifying to leave everything that you have known because everything has been vilified for you thinking is hard to do on your own when you have all of the thought stopping techniques, when you have had behavior control, we crave being told what to do. We look for that. I think that's, again, why in politics right now, certain types of people are thriving because groups just want to be told what to think and what to do. Um, But to be able to show them life was really tough and it will actually get tougher when you leave, more so than you ever thought. But now more than ever, We have the internet. We have so much more connection than we have ever had before. And I want everyone to know that I am here. I respond to my messages. I, you are not alone. And if you think that you are truly reach out to to Davey and to Bryce and to myself and people in shiny, happy people, all of them, we are all available and accessible. Um, Just, I was alone and I felt completely alone. So just know you're not alone. And you can do this just it's one day at a time. You can't look at what am I going to do in 20 years? Because honestly, you have no clue what you're going to do. And it will shock you and surprise you when you finally land on what you're good at. It's amazing. And and that that right there truly is the coolest part, because, you know, if you told me 20 years ago (laughs) where I'd be today, I'd call you a liar. If you told me 10 years ago where I'd be today, I'd still call you a liar. Um, (laughs) And it's it's just it's so cool. Um, I love it. And, and, and speaking of which, uh, Lindsay, where can folks get in touch with you online, on social media? How do you want them to reach out? Um, I am in two different places. Um, as far as all of this um, with cult stuff, I am the Cult Chronicles. Um, basically because I was telling my, my chron- I chronicled my story on TikTok. So you can find me there as well as Instagram. Both are the Cult Chronicles. If you want to email me personally and not deal with social media, you can email me the cult chronicles at gmail.com and if you're curious about what the hell i do with my real life um because it's my real life and uh you guys can check me out at crazypretty.com that's my website it's my portfolio if you will um and also please go follow me on instagram crazy pretty perfect well i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure you'll have some folks reaching out to you because this story is just 
uh, it's so fascinating, but it but it's so incredibly encouraging as well. And mm-hmm. I know I know people are going to have so many questions, especially about you know, how you cultivated that relationship with your husband, because I think that's mm-hmm. something a lot of us struggle with coming out of IBLP, coming out of the shiny happy people yeah. cult, is having good healthy relationships especially of the romantic variety yeah and it's so hard. i would love i would love to get you on on a live stream at some point totally Lindsay, just so we can we can talk about some more of that because I, I know there's a lot of curiosity 100 percent. Um, i'm an open book thank you so much for being here this has been just incredible absolutely incredible Lindsay. so thank you for your time bryce thank you for being here uh, if you're watching, please like, comment, and share. Be sure to subscribe, uh, and we will see you next week. <laughs> we love you. Thanks, guys.